spirit. Another interesting fact, um, when people talk about the gaucho culture, the, the, this is the cowboys in Argentina, uh, most research will tell you if you trace it back, the gauchos have two roots. One is African and one is Native American. The African or Fulani and cattle raising people that were enslaved, brought to Brazil, they escaped from Brazil and they exiled themselves or escaped to Argentina, became part of that gaucho. Now the gaucho culture is one of these very independent autonomous type of cultures. The gaucho culture was predicated on African cattle culture. And you have these three pounds or two pounds of sweet sauces or chorizos from, from Portugal. So when you see in red, that's a European influence. These are these usually the scraps that again, anybody knows that sausage is probably the most scraps of any particular animal and then taken and put in the lining. And the lining of the sausage is just the intestines of the animal. And then the African components. Spare ribs. You see Africans in cattle raiding community on special occasions eating things like spare ribs. And then there's the dindi oil that comes up again. Dindi oil continues to be used in Brazil because it has that tropical climate where you can raise it. Now, again, when Africans came to places like New Jersey where there were enslaved Africans or other parts of the Hudson Valley or even Virginia, they, again, assimilation process. You cannot, the topography does not allow you to grow palm trees and have dindi oil. So you use things like lard because that was what's given to you as part of your rations. So you use what you could as a way of assimilating and adapting to your new environment. One thing interesting about um, the Inquisition in Latin American cultures, uh, the Inquisition, as you all know, was an attempt to fed out uh, both uh, Islamic people as well as Jewish people. So one thing that people did, look, what people would do to try to hide themselves from the Inquisition is or to prove themselves to be Catholic was to overconsume pork products. And instead of using olive oil, using lard to bake. Again, as a way of identifying themselves with the Catholic faith and keep themselves from being persecuted as, con as, as conversos. Again, here you have bay leaves from Asia. And the interesting thing about bay leaves that I just learned the other day from a show I was listening to that I did not know that. Bay leaves, you, can, you do not want to consume by themselves. They are poisonous that will kill you. But as a seasoning, you can use them. But an uncooked bay leaf can particularly poison you and put you in the emergency room, which I did not realize. So it's strictly a seasoning in that sense. One large onion, again from Asia, and garlic again from Asia. This one is really interesting. Uh, this is empanada. I'm so glad that you all ate something before I started uh, putting these slides on and that we're, thank God we're about to eat. We're winding down. An empanada, as you know, comes from uh, Spanish food ways and introduced to the Americas, and people would make empanadas from all different kind of things. Now, the yam. Yam is central to West African culture. You know, in West Africa, there's regions of West Africa that were known as the rice belt, particularly between Cape Verde and um, regions all the way to Ghana, known as the rice belt because <coughs> rice was so important to the cultivation and to the uh, culinary experience there. But there are also regions in the Niger River Valley, particularly in, uh, uh, in Nigeria, known as yam belts, because yams were consumed so much. Uh, how many people here have read the book, Things Fall Apart? Anybody read the Things Fall Apart, the book? Great novel by Chinua and Chebi, and in that novel, yams are central. Now, the, the African and the American, and this is something, again, people don't know. Yams are indigenous to Africa. But then you do have things that come from Asian culture that, that are introduced. For example, the cocoa yam. The cocoa yam comes from Asia. Africans use it all over their cuisine now. You also have sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are an American plant. And again, during the slave trade, the Portuguese and other European societies introduced to Africa. But yam is indigenous to Africa. So during the, the African slave trade, yams were introduced as a staple to keep slaves alive during that Middle Passage and became part of American culture. But it's the sweet potato that is indigenous. Now, most of us, including those who would swear they know better, cannot tell the difference between a yam and sweet potato. And there are so many varieties that it is very difficult. But again, it's one of these things where you take a, uh, a dish, an empanada, and then you, you do a solo and you use yam in that empanada, you stuff it with yam. And then with orange flavor that comes from, from, from Asia. So here there's three different components, three different culinary components are made up in this one particular dish. Here's another one that was sold by enslaved women in, um, 
and Cartagena in Colombia, South America. And it's cassava, again, American plant, uh, used in, and made into different drinks, but also made with corn and chocolate, two American plants. There are actually three American plants that African cooks then used to actually, many of them used this to, to raise money to gain manumission to buy the manumission of somebody else. But again, it's a great example of improvisation, what, sh what chefs do. So they would make different type of corn cakes back home, but when they get to the Americas, what's in abundance? It's chocolate, it's corn, and it's cassava. And they took this and sold it. Now, anybody recognize this one? This is mafongo. Okay, mafongo is essentially pounded green yams. Okay, uh, plantains, excuse me, pounded green plantains. Another example, plantains are from Asia. They were introduced via Madagascar again to Africa. They become an important part of African cuisine, something you will see in African markets before Africans arrive in the New World. Now, if you go to anywhere in Latin America, from Mexico to the Dominican Republic to Cuba, people are eating plantains, a plant from Asia. And most people have no idea that it's from Asia. So mafungo is this pounded plantain and think about the pounded plantain. It goes back to Africa, where Africans would take yams and pound them and make fufu. A lot of the dishes were made, they made fufu from plantains, fufu from, from uh, yams, and all these different things. But yeah, if you're looking, you'll see tomato, the American plant. So you got an Asian plant, American plant, shrimp. You can, obviously, you can get shrimp from all different places. And then you see some of the, pea, of the, uh, the green peppers are also from America. But again, it's just an example. It's the African cooks who come here and take the, 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 uh, the plant that's in abundance and make a new dish and it's used all over the Caribbean. Mafungo. Green plantains, garlic, ground pepper, saffron. We haven't talked about the influence of the Moors. Okay, so you have the Moorish invasion of uh, the Iberian Peninsula from 1712 to roughly 1500 and bringing all kinds of Middle Eastern foodways into uh, Iberian cuisine. And then Iberians taking that, those foodways and coming to the Americas and influencing the areas where they hold uh, enslaved African cooks and, and require and teach these enslaved African cooks to use saffron. So saffron becomes a regular part of Caribbean cooking. But again, it's introduced by the Moors. And the chicken stock. Now, chicken we haven't talked about. In, in Africa, I found that there were two types of fowl. There were guinea fowl that were local, and then there were fowl that were introduced uh, from, from Asia. There was actually a fowl introduced from Asia. So there were two different types. And both those types actually came over to the Americas during the African slave trade. The fowl were not indigenous to, uh, to the Americas as far as I know. All right, so that actually, this actually should say Africa rather than America on it. And then again, the oil, Depending on where you are, it could be dindi oil or it could be a local vegetable oil. And then uh, the crackling. It's, it's the pork that is influenced by Europeans. Uh, it's funny, I have a, a citation that talks about the, in places like the Dominican Republic where <laughs> people had so much confidence in pork that they thought that if you were sick, it was the best thing to give to somebody who was sick to make them recover. Now we all, you know, there's so an opposition to what doctors saying now. But it really was one of those European influences. And pork was introduced to, by Europeans to Africa as well as the Americas. Anybody know what this is? Aki and codfish, the national dish in Jamaica. All right, this is aki, the plant. So you see this right here? This is the plant aki, comes from West Africa. The national dish. This is kalaloo, which is kind of like uh, cilantro, spinach, you know, kind of the Caribbean version of collard greens. Okay, and then the rice is, you know, as we talked about from West Africa, and then there's cornbread, never too far away. Again, this is the natural dish. This is onions that it's made with, peppers. Oh, I love this dish. Really, really good. But now, this is another thing. You all know cassava, aki, both of these, if you don't know what you're doing, you can poison yourself. You have to process it in a certain way to actually to consume it. So the poison has to be extracted from it before you actually cook. You got to know what you're doing. There's the ackee fruit and sweet potatoes. Now, this is another example we talk about culinary improvisation. 
The pie culture that has nothing to do with Africa. That is introduced to the Africans when they come to the New World, <coughs> and they become the cooks for slaves, particularly from the British Empire. So they take this culinary experience that they get from their enslaved people, and they introduce it with their yam culture. But in many places, they don't have yams. They have sweet potatoes, but they use it the same way. So you come up with sweet potato pie, which is, again, one of those things on a special occasion. You know, if you're a southerner, white or black. I mean, this is kind of an interesting thing that people say. First of all, southerners, white or black, they don't do pumpkin pie, folks. I'm sorry. They just don't do that. That's just like, you see a southerner eat pumpkin pie, they look at you like, that's like sugar in your cornbread? Why would you do that? Southerners don't do that. They don't put sugar in their cornbread, and they don't do pumpkin pies. Again, it's the influence of the African around them. So that you see them eating these kind of dishes. But again, this is a prime example of African cooks and European food ways put together. 